Joining us from London is writer and broadcaster Esther Kraku. Esther, Merry Christmas and welcome to our last show of the year. Look, you've been a huge part of this show throughout 2023. What are your highlights and lowlights? Uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, well, where to begin? I mean, 2023 started off, obviously, with the with the publication of Spare by Harry, uh, which, you know, following the Netflix documentary and the Oprah interview was just another in the series of, of the Sussexes uh, whinging and complaining and, and uh, allegations against how poorly they were treated uh, by the royal family. Um, and, you know, going from that to, obviously, <laughs> the South Park episode, which was effectively mocking the Sussexes and talking about the Worldwide Privacy Tour, uh, the, the King's coronation, uh, which was, you know, just went smoothly considering everything that he had to deal with all year um, to Princess Catherine and, and Prince William really making uh, you know, a name for themselves with, with uh, Princess Catherine's uh, Shaping Us uh, campaign, uh, Prince William's um, home, tackling homelessness in Britain. Um, it was, it's really been quite a roller coaster of a year, um, but it's been enjoyable as well. I mean, it's, it's been an honor to report on the, the comings and goings of the royal family and even the renegade royals in, in Montecito. <laughs> Absolutely. And we have never been without stuff to talk about, that's for sure. And what do we know so far about the plans on both sides of the pond for 2024? So we know that uh, with uh, the Duke... Oh the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. They have uh, apparently multi-million dollar deals lined up. Um, they, they're really going to be pushing for quite a commercially successful year uh, after uh, quite a rocky 2023. We know that um, Meghan's podcast with Spotify uh, archetypes was cancelled. Uh, they have apparently had an interesting relationship with Netflix. We should expect more uh, production from them this year, well, the year 2024, apparently. Um, so they, they, they're looking more to exert their influence in creative spaces, which is quite a shift from, you know, what they were doing in the royal family. I am skeptical as to whether that's really where Prince Harry's heart really lies. I mean, for, for all the kind of shenanigans that we, we saw with Ginger Harry uh, in, the, in the early 2000s, he, he was a pretty serious character. This is someone that was in the army um, and that he spearheaded a lot of successful campaigns campaigns with the royal family to go from that to, to you know effectively um, buying the rights to a book to making films and to do things that seem much more up Megan's uh, lane uh, is, is a bit strange but we'll see how they'll get on with it I, I mean we've we've been hearing that we hope they will stick to something that doesn't have to do with harping on about the royal family but again we have to remember that that's been part of their success you know the the, the proximity they have to the royal family um, it, it has been what's fueled the, the novelty and the intrigue around them and then you have the prince and princess of of Wales that are continuing um, with, with supporting the King in their work. We know that Catherine didn't travel um, internationally on any royal engagements in 2023. Um, she's going to be continuing on with her Shaping Us campaign, um, which is a campaign to um, help uh, families with young children um, with regards to their children's early development and also to support to help businesses support families with young children. So she's going to be keeping that up as well. Um, we know that William, uh, only traveled to Poland uh, last year and Singapore. Poland was to go and support uh, the troops on the Polish-Ukrainian border, um, as well as to speak to some refugees to get a bit more um, on the ground knowledge. Um, and he also is involved with the Outshot campaign, so he'll be traveling again uh, in 2024 to support that. So they do have some plans in the works. It's very likely that uh, the king will um, travel to, to have more royal engagements abroad. Um, I, I believe Canada and Australia should be on that list, but we will get confirmation next year. Um, so that's going to be on the, the Prince and Princess of Wales' side. They're just going to be supporting the king and his duties. He is getting on. He is 75. Um, so that's that, that's probably going to be more of their focus. And I, su I suspect they're going to get more support from other members of the royal family, especially since, as we said before, uh, there's kind of been a big gap where the Sussexes should have been to, to support um, the monarch in that way. And this week, the BBC, they aired a new documentary, Charles III. Here's a clip. In a sense, you felt you're part of a, a family occasion as well as, uh, you know, a royal occasion and a national occasion. What I get from these rehearsals is just clearly what a great, hugely meaningful moment this is for both of them. I say a prayer with the crown up there and then slowly lower it, tipping forward. Yes, if you have to sleep, you have to jam it on. So it has to come down to here first. Esther, the documentary rated very well. What made it so engaging for the viewing public? 
I think it was just, you know, an insight into what was going through the king's uh, mind when he was about to become king. Obviously, we know that the passing of the queen was was uh, d very sad, a deeply sad moment for 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 the country. And so, but, but this kind of transition into the the new the new era of the monarchy uh, was something that people looked forward to. And you know, this is something that he's been primed for his entire life. So many people wanted to know, you know, what was going on behind the scenes. Um, I think the, the the most telling or the most engaging moment of, of the documentary though was the interview with. Princess Anne, um, who spoke about, you know, the Queen, the late Queen, not wanting to be a bother by, by passing away in Balmoral. She was actually worried that her funeral arrangements would be would be troubled or become more cumbersome if she passed in Balmoral, which, again, it, it, I, I do think it was quite a striking moment because you think even, even in her dying moments, she's trying to think of how not to be a, a bother. Um, and these were very candid moments in, in the documentary that I, I do think resonated a lot with the country. I mean, obviously, the, there has been criticisms of, of the documentary saying that it, it wasn't um, challenging enough or it was kind of like a PR spin on, on the royal family. Um, and we, we obviously understand that with the Republican movement uh, being at an all-time high uh, this year, I think about 28%, you know, you want to, to put as much of a realistic spin on, on what the royal family does. But at the end of the day, you know, the king is the king. The coronation is about pomp and ceremony and all of that. And there's not really much kind of realness you can get into it because most people most people will never ever experience that in their lives. Um, but I, I do think it had very sort of human moments, particularly with, with Princess Anne and Anne. And uh, I, I do think it was quite a success. Look, it has been noted that Harry didn't feature in the documentary. Is that really a surprise, though? It's not a surprise. I mean, he didn't feature in the documentary, I suspect, because he didn't really feature in the, in the coronation at all. He just flew in, uh, had a seat in the back, and then flew out. Uh, he didn't really have much engagement um, in, this, in the ceremony at all. Um, his children and his wife uh, opted to stay in California, even though for some reason he insisted on giving his, his kids the prince and princess title. Um, but we'll leave that there. Uh, but there was not really much to, to, to talk about. He was not the focus. This was not about him. Um, he's made his feelings of, of the institution and the royal family very clear. Um, I think if, if he was included, the bigger question was why, why did he choose to be there? Um, in the first place, but that wasn't the focus. Obviously, this was about King Charles and his coronation and, and the monarchy being in a new era. And I think it was a good thing that it focused on that. And something else has been reported this week is the close relationship between Prince William and Mike Tyndall. Ordinary, you'd think that was a unlikely bromance, but it seems to work, doesn't it? I do think it seems to work, actually. Uh, if you if you see uh, pictures of Mike Tyndall um, on Christmas Day, he's 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 very much you know the, the laddish you know, sportsman, um, and and him and William have a, a certain kind of camaraderie. I mean, <laughs> Mike calls William one pint will one pint Willie um, because apparently he's not a very good drinker. Um, but again, to be to be a good drinker against a rugby player of the size of Mike Tyndall is, is quite a feat. So it's, it's not surprising. But, you know, ever since this this rift between Harry and William, you can understand why uh, Mike and William uh, may have grown closer. They do have a lot in common. They've both been uh, with their respective um, wives for over 20 years. They both have children. Um, young children under the age of eight. Um, and you could see that the, there is a close bond between the cousins as well. Um, Mike Tyndall, you know, he doesn't really follow royal protocol. He's not really about the kind of polished royal life. This is someone who didn't go to university, started playing rugby for Bath at the age of 18. Um, and he's always been unapologetically himself. And I think that's quite refreshing for someone like William, who knows he has to be prim and proper and, and follow uh, royal protocol. And I do think that this chasm between um, William and Harry has, in a way, solidified the relationship between um, Mike and William. If, if you think about it, it can, it can be quite isolating um, being in the royal bubble, and you need you need that kind of uh, relief. And I think Mike and William's relationship really does attest to that. And on to Zara, she's also recently said that she considers herself lucky uh, that Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, didn't give her and her brother titles. She appears to have her mother's pragmatism, um, I guess, and look, a very good understanding of how royal business works. 
Absolutely. And, you know, this is one of the most famous royals uh, without actually the, the, the prince, princess title. Uh, and she, she's really made good use of it. She's been very influential. She is, you know, world champion equestrian. Um, she has won an MBE. And she's always been about her own privacy and, and living a life that, you know, is impactful, but not in, in, in the spotlight. I mean, this is someone who turned down having a televised wedding. Um, instead, she had a low-key, at least by royal standards, uh, wedding in, in Scotland with with. 400 guests, if, if only I could be so lucky. I don't think I even know 400 people. Uh, but she's always been very practical. Um, and, and, you know, I think that decision that uh, Princess Anne took for her children was actually very important. We know, now know that, you know, Zara is 21st in line to the throne, so she's never going to... It's highly unlikely that she will ever ascend the throne. Um, but we also know that uh, Princess Anne's siblings chose to give their kids uh, prince and princess, well, princess titles and earl and lady. Um, but she specifically chose not to do that because she wanted to give them the choice. And I think that's actually made Zara very grounded. It's, it's the reason why, you know, she has the, the freedom to, to, to live the life that she wants and, and marry someone like Mike Tyndall, who, who is, wouldn't be the, the first choice for most royal marriages. Now, we've spoken before about the royal racism row. It uh, doesn't seem to be going away. What's the update and how could those allegations become relevant again? So apparently Samantha Markle's lawyers are looking to, to have a deposition with the Sussexes um, in their ongoing uh, lawsuit, which, which Samantha says, you know, Meghan libelled her um, in her interview with Oprah by painting her as not having a sister growing up, and that Samantha changed her last name to Markle when, when Meghan started dating Harry, um, which implies that she did that so she can have some re relevance or proximity to Meghan Markle. And that's something that Samantha has been in court um, trying to, to rectify because she believes that it had a very very negative impact on her on her reputation and it made her look like a liar um, we know that um, the Sussexes lawyers have been stonewalling um, Samantha Markle's um, legal team's attempt to get some more information some more documentation from them to actually interview them under oath um, but it doesn't look like this case is going to get thrown out of court uh, by a judge like the Sussexes would hope so we actually we're waiting developments on that as well I mean the Samantha's lawyers are actually trying to uh, you know get the whole story from from the royal racist allegations to anything that have come out of the Sussex's mouth because, again, if you're trying to win a libel case, you want to paint the other party as unreliable and, you know, not truthful. And we already know that the Sussexes have been quite inconsistent with a lot of their uh, testimonies or, or recollections of various events. So this this could actually come back to bite them. I'm not sure the, the strength of the case. We do know that America is, is a completely different ball game. You know, people sue each other over very basic things all the time. Um, but we don't actually know the, the strength of this case, so we'll have to wait and see. But that, that's another development in 2024 that could um, come back quite negatively on the Sussexes. And lastly, some good advice for the Sussexes. They've been urged to take a year of silence. And while it's probably a good idea to, you know, help them rehabilitate their image, I'm not sure they would cope outside the limelight. Your thoughts? I mean, I, I don't think the, the Sussexes would, would know what to do with themselves if they weren't in the limelight. I, I just, I find their transition quite interesting. This is a couple um, that were happy to leave the royal family as they felt they were suffocating them and giving up the opportunity to um, spearhead important campaigns. And now they're trying to use their influence to, to spearhead campaigns, but in a different sphere, in the creative sphere, where they're signing, um, you know, multi-million dollar deals, they've got book rights, they're, they're planning on releasing content, because we know in this industry, content is king. Um, it, it's quite, it's going to be quite an interesting year for them, because on the one hand, we know that if they don't speak about the royal family and their pro proximity to the, to, to, to the royal family, they won't have as much sway, they won't have as much appeal, their star is waning, and the, the novelty would have worn off. But on the other hand, what can they possibly do? They've now almost become you know, subjects of, of, of ridicule. They can't have the same seriousness and cachet to talk about really substantial things. And this is why I think you know, the creative avenue is, is, is the only uh, way for them. I mean, I was talking about the fact that they had an opportunity to talk about so many things. Even when Princess Diana um, divorced uh, King Charles, you know, she was talking about landmines and, all, and, and HIV and all of these really consequential uh, societal issues. And I don't think they have the, the, the seriousness or the sway to be able to talk about that in any, in any real way, because now they're going down the kids' route of, of, of content and, and films and, 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 you know, 
books and all of that and it's just it does it seems like such a waste because they could have done so much and i think they've made such a spectacle of themselves that they they don't have that ability anymore um so i do think maybe a year out would be would be a good idea but again time is money if they took a year out they may not be able to pay uh for their their expensive security so let's just see what they're going to do Esther Kraku, thank you for joining us this evening and thank you for your insights tonight and throughout the year. We look forward to having you back in 2024.